Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Marcus. I'm Ben. Uh, and we are here at FHI. Uh, and we both work at the Center for the Governance of AI here at the Future of Humanity Institute. Uh, and we'll be chatting a little bit about like uh, research uh, coming out of our, our center uh, and sort of giving some tips uh, about what you might want to do if you want to go into a career in AI governance, basically. Uh, so let's like to take us away. Uh, yeah, Ben, like how did you get into the field of AI governance? Yeah, so I guess I got involved um, a few years ago. So um, I was just graduating from college and I was majoring in physics and philosophy um, yeah. and was considering actually going into the philosophy of physics. Hmm. Um, and then had some doubts on the basis of um, perhaps it not being either the most useful or employable field of, of all the fields. Right. Um, and at, just around the same time as well, I was getting interested in ideas associated with effective altruism. And then a professor at my university, um, Alan Defoe, who, who heads the center, mm -hmm. um, was just himself transitioning into focusing on AI governance from a sort of long-termist perspective. And so uh, he put out a call for research assistance, uh, looking oh, nice. for people who might want to get involved. Um, and then, yeah, it just happened to be a good time where I was ready to transition into something else and it seemed important and it seemed like at the time not many people were thinking about it. So mm -hmm. that's how I got involved. Cool, cool. And what, what happened next? Uh, yeah, so I basically worked as a part-time uh, research assistant for um, about a year or so. Um, at the same time, I actually um, got a job at the Center for Effective Altruism and I was sort of like doing a part-time thing with Alan while I was working here. Um, and then after about a year or so of doing that, I decided I wanted to sort of transition sort of into the area full time um, and there happened to be an opportunity to do that. Right, right. Okay, so it sounds like a kind of sort of random or something. You, you just, this ha opportunity happened to pop up and you, you sort of were positioned such that you could yeah, could I think, want it to So I think there's definitely a high degree of randomness. Like it wasn't, um, it wasn't just like a, oh, this is a, a random interesting, interesting thing entirely. So I, I definitely right. at the time um, had gotten more interested in ideas associated with, associated with long-termism and right. effective altruism. So I guess the topic of AI, AI governance was a bit on my radar, but right. um, roughly almost exactly the same time I became interested in the topic, this opportunity came up. Um, so that was definitely, cool. yeah, element of randomness there. Cool. Um, yeah, and sort of, uh, yeah, how has sort of your, um, your work in the field, like, changed? Um, I think quite, I'd say quite a lot. Um, so I think I, I still, you know, have a, a fairly broad focus in the area, but I think when we first started, there was this real sense that, um, you know, AI was going to be this thing that was really important. Everyone had, like, you know, started to believe that, like, just mm -hmm. around then, that was, like, just around the time, like, AlphaGo, um, Right, you so know, like 2016. Yeah, exactly. Point, yeah. Um, and then superintelligence had been been written, and that you know, presented a sort of specific version of the like long termist concern around AI. Mm -hmm. And it was this broad sense, you know, oh man, um, AI seems like it could be this really transformative technology. There might be these risks that you know people don't really understand very well yet. Um, almost no one, almost no one was working on, for example, AI safety at the time. But there was also this sort of thing people were saying, where, like almost literally no one is thinking about mm -hmm. like long term sort of like governance challenges associated with AI. Mm -hmm. um, like there was even at the time, not that much just like, you know, AI governance work of, of any kind going on. Um, and so I think a lot of early stuff was just like a little bit like what even is going on here? What exactly mm -hmm. are we trying to do? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it also was probably like a lot more, you know, naive mm -hmm. than research then. Cause you know, people really just, I think a lot of people were tr just transitioning in and no one really right. knew that much about the area. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. And you're now doing a, a DFIL here at, here at Oxford? So yeah. like a, that's Oxford D's for like a PhD, basically? Uh, yeah, so just started, um, uh, yeah, Oxford PhD, essentially in international relations, just this like, just past term. Um, just because, um, yeah, so I guess, you know, my only credential in the area so far continues to be an undergraduate degree mm -hmm. in completely unrelated fields. <laughs> um, and so it seemed, you know, somewhat useful to maybe uh, get a proper degree in, in education in a, in a field that's that's somewhat more relevant to, to governance than right. than physics. Right, right, yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, so just to, to turn the question around around mm -hmm. on you, Marcus. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, tell me about how did, how did you get involved? I, I realize actually I don't have a really great sense of how you first sort of... Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I guess um, I, it's sort of slightly convoluted story. So, so I got like, um, sort of involved in and sort of interested in sort of effective altruism style questions mm -hmm. while at university. So that was like maybe 2011, 2013 or something like this. Um, and then for a while I sort of, um, I, I sort of got involved with Give What We Can and these kinds of uh, organizations 
um, and then sort of had a few years of, of sort of transitioning from a belief of like, oh, okay, like long term, something like long termism. I guess we didn't have a word for that back then. Uh, but something like long termism seems true. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm like not convinced that like these sort of like focusing on like emerging tech style questions were like mm -hmm. reasonable because it just didn't seem to me like it was difficult to see like sensible concrete things that mm -hmm. you could do in the area. Um, but then over like a few years time, I think I was like, I became like increasingly convinced that like there seemed to be things to do. Um, and so then I just like, uh, when I graduated uni in 2016, um, I, yeah, basically I was, so I was moving back to Sweden at that point. Um, and so like looking at like what to do in Sweden, I was like not really, I couldn't really find a lot of like super exciting options. And so I decided that I would like, like initially like try to like build up career capital. And so I did the classic thing of, of going into management consulting uh, and did that for a few years. That was like really, really fun, really interesting. I felt like I learned a lot. Uh, and then after a while, I just like felt like sort of the development trajectory kind of like leveled off. Um, and I just like wasn't learning as much anymore. Um, and it was like less interesting. Um, I also felt like I could probably like do more by like working like more directly on like the cause areas that I cared about. Um, and then I transitioned into working for like Effective Outs in Sweden, uh, basically with like a belief that like uh, it seemed like um, yeah, building sort of the EA community seemed like a good idea. Uh, I wanted to stay in Sweden at that point as well. Um, and so it looked like one of the best opportunities I could have would be to like uh, head up that organization. Um, so I got funding to do that for like, and did that like for about a year. Um, and then during that time, I basically got convinced that like, uh, if I, if I was like willing to like live elsewhere than Sweden, uh, I would like, could do like more good with my career elsewhere. Um, and so then I like started to look into like other options and basically my algorithm was like, I'll look for things where, um, <laughs> it was something like, I, my, my description of like my comparative advantage was something like, I'm like a, a management consultant person who kind of like understands the research or something, <laughs> or like the, the, the simpler version is like, I was a management consultant who, who like gets it. Um, and then, and so then I like, uh, basically like looked for roles that looked like basically working for like organizations doing research in uh, areas that I cared about where sort of my so, like broader skill sets, like being able to like help out with operations, help out with like recruitment and those kinds of things could come in handy. Um, and then I just like applied to a bunch of things that fit that bill uh, where like GovAI was one of them. Uh, so it wasn't specifically that I was like, oh, AI governance seems like the mo very most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then I like just like looked for ways to help out there. Mm -hmm. It was more like a broad class of things that seemed useful. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, maybe next let's chat a little bit about like research uh, that you've been up to recently. Um, so in 2018 for EAG London, you did this talk on, uh, um, uh, what, was the, what was the title? It was oh, like, I think, um, how sure are we about this AI stuff? Right, yeah. okay. Uh, and so I guess like I'm inclined to ask like how, how sure are we about this AI stuff? Um, so I think still, Still not, well, I guess there's two ways of being sure. So there's yeah. like, you know, there's, I guess, the robust, like, how sure are we that if we had sort of all the facts and we had all the considerations, we'd think that this is one of the top, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, like two or three priorities for the EA movement. Um, and then there's a separate sense, which is like, um, given the limited amount of information we have at the moment um, and given, you know, the limited number of considerations we have, um, how sure are we that even on that basis, just at least an expectation, it makes sense for us to be putting, you know, a lot of resources in this area. Mm -hmm. And I think the first one, I think we're, you know, I think we're really not very sure, but it's just very hard to be sure because there's right. so much we don't know. We don't know, um, like, we don't know what future AI systems will look like. We don't know what the yeah. pace of progress will look like. We have a lot of trouble even imagining a world with, like, you know, AI systems are a lot more advanced than what we have today. We don't have a great sense of you know exactly what institutions will matter when you know interesting stuff happens. Mm -hmm. We don't exactly have a great sense of just so much of it, but that's that's to some extent the nature of yep. you know any technology where there's going to be massive changes is you right. just really don't have a great picture. It might not be different for like AI versus like other cause areas. Um, so I think more for AI. So if you think about yep. you know let's say climate change or, or something, there's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of uncertainty we have. So for example, you know climate models. Um, you know, we don't exactly know how to model certain feedback loops and we don't exactly know, you know, mm -hmm. like how to think about low likelihood events, like how likely, you know, is it like one in a thousand or like one in a hundred for like extreme you know, right. feedback loops making things much worse than their models predict. Yeah. We still have sort of a basic sense of, you know, 
the rough parameters of things. Like the main yeah. parameters, just like how hot will things get to some extent, mm -hmm. and then yeah. there's some stuff. You how need. bad is hot? Yeah, how bad is hot? You know, yeah. exactly where hot, where yeah. where less hot, that yeah. that sort of thing. <laughs> um, whereas for AI, it's just you know, if we're talking about let's say in a long run world where just you know human labor doesn't really you know isn't really necessary for most tasks. Just AI mm -hmm. systems are essentially replacing it. Um, it seems like there's so many dimensions along which we just don't know what that world, you know, mm -hmm. looks like. We don't know what those AI systems are like. We don't know just how that's organized or right. it's just very, very difficult to picture. It's a bit like, um, as like an analogy, like it's a bit like being in, you know, 1500 and someone tells you, describes in very rough terms like the internet. Like they yeah. say, oh, you know, communication is going to be much, much faster and more efficient mm -hmm. and information retrieval is going to be better. Mm -hmm. There's a bit you can do to reason, you know, about, about that sort of world, like, oh, I guess, um, you know, maybe you could have larger businesses because they can communicate, the offices yeah, exactly. can communicate, you know, yeah. differently. Um, but you definitely, if you try to visualize it, you're not going to be visualizing the internet. You can be visualizing, I don't know, very fast carrier pigeons or, yeah. or, yeah, like, exactly. yeah. or something like, you know, it's just, you're going to be way off on it. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to even identify a single dimension along which, like, you're uncertain. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess broadly, I feel to some extent that's a little bit where we're at with AI. Right. Um, which is a long way of saying, I think, um, it's really hard to be, to be sure. Um, I think just in terms of the, the sort of weaker standard of like, how sure are we, like, mm -hmm. how sure are we on the basis of the little we understand, the mm -hmm. few considerations we have, but at the very least what makes a lot of sense for, um, you know, a decent chunk of the AA movement to be focusing on this. Yeah. Um, I do actually feel, um, I think pretty good about that. Like I, I think ideally... I would maybe have a, a slightly smaller portion of the EA portfolio focus on AI, but it seems right. pretty clear to me that you should at least have, you know, um, you know, a few dozen people like really actively thinking about the long-term implications um, of AI. And it seems like we're not that far from that number sadly at the moment. Hmm. Okay, wait, that sounds smaller than I expected. Like, so, so when you say like, yeah. oh, uh, like a smaller like yeah. proportion of the portfolio yeah. should be focused on AI. What's your current view on like what that percentage is? Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's quite difficult. Um, so, but like ballpark. Yeah. Um, so I'd say not unreasonable if um, uh, it's, I think it's it's yeah it's really hard to think of like exactly how I'm defining the the split between things. Yeah. Um, I think it, maybe I I want something like um, one in five people who are like, you know, sort of fully engaged like long-term oriented um, right. EA people to be thinking about AI primarily. Right, okay. Whereas now you'd, like, you'd feel like the number is like if, if, three if, and five, four and five or something? Yeah, it feels to me like it might be more than half. I'm not sure if that's correct, right. but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, and so what would be the like intervention that you would like to have or like what would you like these people to be focused on instead? Yeah, um, so I think just broadly it's, it's I think there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, um, so I think a lot of this is just based on the skill sets that people have and the yeah. sort of work that people are naturally inclined to do. So it's possible that um, just on the basis of there being lots of people with, you know, computer science degrees and things like that, mm -hmm. and interested in EA, that, you know, that on its own might justify the, the really strong AI focus, but just yeah. imagining completely fungible people who could sort of, like, work equally well on anything. Yeah. Um, I really still think that um, sort of fundamental, like, sort of cause prioritization research mm -hmm. is, like, still pretty neglected. Yeah. Um, so I think... For example, like, there's a lot of really good work, I think, being done at the, the Global Priorities Institute. But mm -hmm. I think there's just, there's some broad topics that just seem, you know, um, pretty relevant to long-termism that just not that many people are thinking about that seem kind of crucial. So these questions, yeah. like, for example, the thing that Phil Trammell was working on, mm -hmm. of, um, should we just be, you know, trying to basically, should we assume that we don't have really great opportunities to influence the future now relative to what future people might have if we sort of save our money and allow it to... Right. sort of accumulate over time? Should we be trying to sort of pass resources on to people in the future yep. um, to, to sort of potentially use yeah. more wisely? Yeah. Seems like very crucial for the, for the like, long-termist community. Yep. Um, broadly, even within AI as well, I think there's strangely not that many people thinking about um, just sort of at the somewhat meta level, like what exactly are the pathways for influence in mm -hmm. AI safety and AI yep. governance, yeah, what yeah, exactly yeah. is the nature of the risk? Yep. Um, I think there's a, a handful of people doing this, um, this sort of work um, to some extent like part-time on the side of, you know, on the side of other things. Um, so, for example, like Rowan Shaw is someone I would identify as like someone who's doing, I think, a lot of good, like what exactly is the case for mm -hmm. AI risk. Um, but there's not that many people on that list compared to the, the set of people working on um, AI safety. And I think there is just, it seems like some abstract argument that just, um, 
before you put you know a ton of resources into doing object level work, it's you know quite useful early on to try and put a lot of resources into sort yeah. of like yeah. prioritization between different kinds of object level work, or try yeah. to figure out what exactly is the thing that's motivating this object level work. Yeah. Yeah, so one of your one of your like complaints in that yeah. talk was like basically this of like, yeah. oh, it seems like we're putting a lot of resources into this, but mm -hmm. I'm not seeing a lot of like proper sort of like write ups or people like actually laying out mm -hmm. the arguments that are like motivating them to sort of make these make these career transitions or like mm -hmm. motivating a lot of people's choices. Um, do you think we've seen like an improvement there? I guess like there are a few things that have been like yeah. published since then. Yeah, so actually I think so there's definitely been um, there's definitely been a degree of improvement since I gave the talk. Um, so I think when I gave the talk was maybe the, the sort of the low point in terms of, um, so I think there, there was this initial period of time where, you know, super intelligence had been written and yep. for a lot of people that was like roughly corresponded to, um, you know, the picture that they had of like the nature of AI risk and, and the motivation for AI governance mm -hmm. um, and things like that. And then over time there's some sort of transition to people often having like fairly different visions of what the nature of the risk is or what the motivation is for AI governance. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of different dimensions of that. So some, you know, one dimension is uh, super intelligence focuses a lot on sort of this like very discrete transition to world with you know mm -hmm. yep. like advanced AI. It's it sort of it sort of presents a picture where there's not that much interesting AI stuff happening and then there's maybe, you know, a day or a week where you transition mm -hmm. into having, you know, quite advanced systems. And a lot of people moved away from that. Um, and also a lot of people, I think, you know, myself included, had started thinking more about um, risks which weren't necessarily safety oriented, which, um, although those are also discussed a bit in super intelligence, definitely aren't the main focus. What do you uh, mean by not safety oriented? Oh, so, um, so it seems like there's lots of concerns you might have about, um, you know, the future of AI not necessarily being great. So just, um, you know, I mean, so one, see, like, major category is just, um, it may be the case that, um, you know, if you transition to a world where human labor is, like, you know, mostly worthless, yep. and, you know, the functions of the government can be automated, um, you know, maybe that's not a great, great, you know, world in terms of, like, democracy or, right. like, yep. the, con the preferences or values of most people being taken into account. Right. Or you might be concerned, for example, about, um, you know, if in the future there might ultimately be ethical questions around, like, the moral status of, you know, AI systems. Mm -hmm. Um, it also seems like maybe those decisions are made um, made wrongly one way or the other, right. um, and I think there's lots of ways you can imagine, or just you know maybe there's some just best case scenario you have for how AI is governed, how it's used, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even if you know stuff is okay, maybe the difference between the best possible world you can achieve and you know like a moderate world is actually the, you know quite substantial. Right. Right. Um, okay. So these are like risks that aren't like accident risks from like very powerful systems or something like this. Yeah, basically. Okay. Um, well, I guess one way, you know, from frame it is, um, you know, we've had like major technological, te technological transitions in history. Um, it seems like you're not uniformly good. So, you know, classic one is Neolithic revolution, mm -hmm. you know, um, agriculture introduced that has a few, you know, later on knockdown effects like the rise of the state and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a bit difficult to do an overall assessment, but, um, you know, that's an example of technology that changed the world really radically, and a lot of the, the results were just really very not, you know, very not positive. So things like right. slavery becomes a massive institution, yeah. and yeah. people seem to become more malnourished, and disease, you know, becomes mm -hmm. a thing. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, hierarchies are established as opposed to, like, more decentralized decision-making. Right. Um, and it seems not that hard to imagine that, um, you know, the same way, if you make, if you do another transition, let's say human labor becomes, you know, replaced by, by capital, basically, that, um, that might have various knock-on effects are really not not you know exactly what we want right yeah yeah and then like so in these previous transitions those sort of the bad consequences that we've seen have like primarily been these like structural effects or something like this. yeah exactly that, like, yeah yeah like yeah slavery becomes like more uh, yeah more economically viable and these kinds of things yeah um, and so so this was kind of like the low point so like yeah so we're like november so 8 2018 it's low point uh, yeah. in the sense of like in, in the sense of yeah so in the sense of um people have like seemingly you know their justifications have changed quite a bit um in right. a lot of different areas but that's not really reflected in almost any published writing mm -hmm. um it's still you know roughly super intelligence and then um i suppose also like some paul christian blog posts and that's, yeah. that's roughly sort of the state of state of affairs yeah um in the sense that, I mean, it's not been, I think, a massive improvement, but definitely yeah. there has been, um, you know, a fair amount of stuff that's come out since then that, um, you know, I think has, has been useful. Um, so, for example, um, I believe this was afterwards. So, for example, like, um, I think Paul Krishan wrote up, you know, a series of blog posts mm -hmm. that were describing um, an argument for 
I guess, safety risks, even in the context of, you know, a continuous transition. Mm -hmm. um, Richard No did some work trying to taxonomize different, different arguments and sort of like lay out what the space currently was. Mm -hmm. Um, Tom Sittler did some similar work. Um, Rohan Shah also wrote, um, I was not really trying to present the case for AI risk. I think <coughs> a really good sequence called the value learning sequence. Mm -hmm. It's basically a series of essays trying to lay out, um, I, I would say roughly like a picture of the nature of the alignment problem. Um, and then um, I believe this was also afterwards, I think. Reframing. I, yeah, I believe so. I think yeah. Eric Drexler's work um, so yeah, at, at FHI um, also came out framing um, he's like quite different picture of mm -hmm. sort of future AI progress and what the nature of the risks there are. Um, so there has been, you know, actually a decent amount of this stuff. I think, mm -hmm. um, so I think quite a bit less than, than I would ideally, oh, and also um, Miri also put out um, a paper on what they're calling MACE optimization, right. which, yeah. which corresponds to one of their main arguments uh, for why they're worried about, you know, AI risk that wasn't, for example, in super intelligence. Mm -hmm. Um, so I spent a fair amount of this stuff. I think it's still quite a bit less than than I would ideally want. Right. Because um, I think still, yeah, I think still there's lots of viewpoints that aren't really captured in existing writing, and I think as well, like a lot of it just really is um, fairly short blog posts. And while you know those are those are useful, I just don't really feel very comfortable. I think um, with a lot of sort of I guess career time and a lot of resources um, being put into an area, if a lot of the main justification is just fairly short blog posts, and some of them also, you know, this sort of, um, it's obviously really, really difficult to communicate clearly about this stuff, because we just yeah. don't really have the right concepts or the right picture of how things will go. Um, but definitely, you know, I think it's not that uncommon for people to, to, like, have arguments about, let's say, what a given post is actually, like, sort of saying, mm -hmm. um, which seems like not, not necessarily a really great sign for, yeah, like, exactly. us as a community really being on the same page about what the, the landscape of, of arguments and considerations is. Right, right. And why do you think this is? Like, do you think that we, like, uh, like why are we in this in this particular situation? Are people, like, individually making mistakes here? Uh, um, and that, like, they should have spent time on this, like, meta-level question? To, I think to to some extent, yes. Um, I mean, I think there's, so I think there's a few things um, that, that make it complicated. So one is I think this sort of stuff is, in fact, just, like, fairly difficult. Because mm -hmm. um, I think to some degree it, like, I think to some degree it requires um, both a decent understanding of like what all, of, you know, what the sort of current landscape of arguments and consider, especially in the safety realm, I think mm -hmm. it like it does require often a pretty good understanding of like yeah. just what's going on in AI safety, just a good understanding of what's going on in current machine learning, um, good ability to do things like conceptual analysis mm -hmm. and synthesis and things like that. Um, and that's, you know, there's maybe not that many people in that bucket at the moment. Um, Another aspect which I think also helps to explain it a bit is I think a lot of the people who are currently working in this area have just, you know, quite recently come into it. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's this sort of unfortunate dynamic where a lot of people have the sense that um, the, you know, arguments or problem framings are currently, like, more worked out than they are and they, they to some extent just haven't been published or they're in someone's head mm -hmm. or, you know, all of the people in the know, you know, have a good understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and then, especially if you come into an area, you know, just to sort of begin with, um, you're not necessarily in a great position to to sort of maybe do this like high level framing work, especially because you just mm -hmm. don't really know what's out there, or what what exists in terms of like unpublished Google Docs. Right. And so I think it's quite easy to just like and maybe sensible if you're just you know entering the area to um, not try and do this high level stuff, but sort of pick an object level topic and then try and work on that. Right. And then I think there's a lot of people who just you know um, and then once you're doing that, it's like it somehow it somehow feels maybe a bit unnatural to sort of drop the object level research program you're now embarked on to, mm -hmm. to this sort of stepping back thing. Like, yeah. I think there's a lot of people who have felt inclined to um, start doing, let's say, high level problem investigation in their sort of spare time in a sense while doing, you know, their, their object level thing is the main thing. But for whatever reason, it does seem like a somewhat um, difficult transition to just drop an object level project you have to do right. to this somewhat more loosey-goosey, like, <laughs> like, oh, what are we even, you know, doing thing. Yeah, yeah. Are there like particular viewpoints that you feel like haven't been accurately represented or like ought to like um, be written up like more thoroughly? Yeah, um, so I think maybe I'll, I guess, so I think um, even ones that have been written up to some extent, I think could really stand to be written yeah. up like further and, and more clearly. So mm -hmm. um, one example is, um, so I think you know, Paul Krishan does for example, have a few good blog posts describing I think one of them is called What Failure Looks Like, where it's meant to be sort of, um, sort of saying, like, 
you know, here is what like a bad outcome might look like, even in the context of um, like a slow transition where stuff mm -hmm. is fairly gradual. Um, like here's what like a bad safety outcome might, might look like. Um, I think the blog posts are quite good, but also at the same time, I do f at least personally feel like they're, you know, there's sort of a limit to sure. how thoroughly or clearly you can communicate in like short blog posts. I do think there's still a lot of ambiguity like about what exactly is, you know, what exactly is this scenario being described? Like, what, what does this look like? Mm -hmm. Like, um, are we talking about something that's like, you know, an act of disaster or just like lost opportunity? Um, like, what exactly is the argument for this being likely? Because um, mm -hmm. to some extent, it's, it's trying to just present the picture of what it might look like as opposed mm -hmm. to making the argument that this is, you know, mm -hmm. that this is necessarily plausible. Um, I think, yeah, just, I think basically like a lot, you know, more could sort of be done there. I think similarly for um, this idea of like MESA optimization, mm -hmm. which, um, is now, I guess, one of the primary justifications that Miri has for, you know, assigning a high probability to sort of safety risk. Mm -hmm. um, I still think there's a lot of ambiguity about what this concept exactly exactly is. Yeah. Um, like, it seems like p different people tend to characterize it differently or perhaps misunderstand the paper or the paper is maybe ambiguous or things like that, but definitely doesn't seem like everyone's on the same sure. page about what exactly this thing is. Right. And it also doesn't really present the case for, the paper doesn't really try to do the thing of, um, it, it sort of argues that there might be this phenomenon that it's calling MESA optimization, mm -hmm. but doesn't really, you know, try to make the argument that um, because this phenomenon might arise, um, then we should view it as an existential risk or, or like a plausible existential risk. Um, so that I think that work still like hasn't really been done. Sure. Yeah. So so a lot yeah. of these uh, so so the arguments that like are out there, yeah. they like ought to be like scrutinized more, etc. Are there like arguments or like classes of views that you feel like don't even have the like the initial like yeah. you know written up thing that you can actually like um, just like start yeah so with? i think there's a couple so i think one is um there's a bit of this for example alan has done has mm -hmm. done some of this work and is you know still thinking like quite a lot about this stuff but yeah. in, in in terms of um i think there's still not a lot written on the idea of structural risks mm -hmm. or just this this concern that um maybe stuff just is like gets really bad in a general sense or it's just very disappointing in terms of our current values mm -hmm. Um, and it's a bit nebulous, it's a bit like, you know, the Neolithic Revolution, where um, it's not like there's some concrete disaster, it's just there's some sort of structural forces that just push things in a direction that, yeah. that you really sort of, you know, ideally wouldn't want. Um, I think similarly, a um, little bit of writing, but really definitely not a ton, this question of um, should we think that certain kinds of, you know, future AI systems have moral status, mm -hmm. and if so, is it, you know, a plausible risk that, um, just that won't really be like respected, and that will be mm -hmm. an important enough development to, you know, for like long termists to, right. to you know, really focus on. Um, I think those are probably two of the the main things that stand out as, in my mind, plausible justifications for a lot of focus in AI. That, you know, I would sort of struggle to point someone to, um, you know, a long write up making a case for these these pathways justifying like EA effort. Right. Right. Okay. And then. Uh, if I were to like turn the thing around on you, like okay, so like you're you're here, you're working on these issues, uh, like what will be your like stab at the like the justification? Yeah, um, I mean I think some of my stab, a lot of my stab at the justification, um, it's um, you know very very not not detailed. It's basically this meta thing of okay, so we're quite you know the starting point is like it seems very, very likely that AI will be really, really transformative. Like it seems like mm -hmm. most people expect, yeah, we will eventually get to the point where just, you know, human labor not necessary for things or for most things. Um, and that world, whatever that looks like, is like obviously extremely different. Yep. And then we have this, you know, set of however you want to count them, like maybe, you know, half dozen-ish, you know, vague, uh, sometimes vaguely sketched arguments for why there might be some, you know, EA path, like, you know, place for like EA leverage to try and make this go like much better or much worse or mm -hmm. like why this could go much better or much worse. Um, and so it seems like there's not that many, if you're sort of taking like a long term perspective and just thinking like what topics might have really long run significance that there might be some chance to influence. Um, I think that there's that set of things is not that large. It's relatively hard to find them, I think. Mm. Um, and then well, at least at this stage at the moment where I think there's a ton of, um, at least value of information and trying to get much clearer about what's going on with AI. Right. Cause it seems at least, you know, one of the few places right now <coughs> where I think it's like plausible, um, long-term it's like, you know, have an opportunity to do 
useful future work. Right. Um, and so this is a bit of another one where I think... Um, so the argument is like, oh, it seems like if you're a long-termist, you should like think about the like the areas mm -hmm. where uh, like that seem like they will have like a large lever leverage of the future. Uh, this seems like our like one of our best bets of like yeah. something. That yeah. Like so yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I think that's basically my viewpoint. Um, where just I think most things, just you know, if you look throughout like history, most things that have like been you know mattered at one particular point in time mm -hmm. just. Um, it just becomes extremely ambiguous what their significance was. Um, you know, if mm -hmm. you look hundreds of years, of years in the future, and especially if you're trying to think like how plausible it is it that like people could have you know known what the impact would be. So like let's say, you know, if you're in the I believe like 1300s, yeah. you know, maybe the big thing going on at the time is like Genghis Khan. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like um, you know naively like the fo maybe your your focus as a 1300s person is like wow this Genghis Khan thing seems like really bad. Like, yeah, exactly. We yeah. should you know really focus on you know, on stopping this Genghis Khan thing. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, probably it would be um, ethically justified, but, you know, at the, from fully, like, long-termist perspective, it's not clear if, you know, like, at, you know, this historians now say things like, oh, well, like, you know, maybe Genghis Khan was, like, good in the long run because <laughs> trade networks or, yeah. or whatnot. I think it's probably, we probably really don't have a great sense. Um, and so, you know, there may have been, like, a, you know, from the short-term perspective, like a good justification for focusing on, on Genghis Khan at the time. Yeah. But if you're, you know, a long-term assistant sitting around and thinking like, what's the most high leverage, you know, thing I can do to affect the future, I really don't have a ton of faith that like, you know, y you would have really been able to predict like what's good and what's bad from a lo long-term right. perspective there. Right. I don't think if you pick like any given century more than like five centuries ago, you're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, probably wind up in the same position with the, the issue of the day. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think just we should have a strong prior that just, um, most topics we look at today, we just really can't, like we may be justified in working on like a, you know, like just from their, their present significance, but if we're like doing long-term prioritization, mm -hmm. I think we should have a prior that most things we really can't predict very well, like, yeah, you know, what the difference will be hundreds of years in the future. Um, and so then there's not that many candidates, I think. Um, and I think insofar as there's at least semi-plausible or potentially or seemingly if you, you know, squint at them, semi-plausible arguments for AI being in this bucket. Yeah. I think that alone is reason enough to want to put, you know, non natural resources into it. Mm -hmm. um, one thing this argument suggests, though, is that perhaps it's um, more useful to put in resource, put resources and try and figure out just like what is going on here mm -hmm. um, than maybe object level resources at the moment. Because um, a lot of the, right. there's a lot of value, informa value of information in terms of trying to figure out like, you know, what's going on here and what's the case for focusing on it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Marcus, so I, um, although I work here, I'm really not very observant. Um, so <laughs> I'd be interested if you could tell me sort of, you know, what is GovAI sort of currently up to in the space? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess like broadly what I think that we should be doing or sort of like what we're trying to do as an organization uh, is uh, trying to be the place that does sort of the, the best research in this like AI governance space uh, mm -hmm. or like what you might call like long-termist AI governance space. Uh, so working on the AI governance questions from like a long-termist perspective, um, and like yeah, what I spend most of my time doing is like doing um, what I can to make sure that we like build uh, that organization that does like the best research in this space, basically. Um, and so like what that looks like in practice is you know we have a lot of different research projects going on, uh, and uh, I personally spend a lot of time on like us like recruiting and like growing in this organization, um, and so. That means, for example, we're, we're running this like GBI fellowship. Uh, we're bringing in people to do basically like three month stints of doing research on some topic that like relates to the kinds of things that we're interested in. Um, and then sort of that's like as like a path into uh, this like AI governance space basically. Um, and that's something that we'll probably, yeah, we'll continue doing like, I think for the foreseeable future, um, like maybe bringing in like roughly like 10 people um, to like every year. Um, I guess we'll see. We'll see this year uh, how like whether we'll be able to like bring people in this summer. Uh, but yeah, I expect I expect us to like continue to do that going forward. And I'm like so far pretty excited about that as a way to like uh, get people into the field. Um, so like currently, um, like this like AI governance field um, as as sort of like I guess like we conceive it. I guess like you've been there since like the start. Yeah. So like since like sometime in like 2016 roughly yeah basically um and uh so given that it's not like you know you you haven't had time to build up like a lot of like institutions that you need for like building a field you haven't like built up a lot of like 
very clear like career pathways for people. Uh, and I think this like fellowship is like one one example of that that we can like start building for people. Um, and then the other thing that I'm like really excited about us doing is like continuing to find like great excellent researchers such as like yourself uh, and bringing them into the team. Uh, and then we'll like I guess like a few years down the line. Um, I guess my hope is we're a team of like I don't know we're like about like a dozen of like truly great researchers uh, hanging out together here in Oxford doing really good research. Um, that's kind of my kind of my hope. Um, and then in terms of like the research that we'll do, I think it'll um, like currently we're we're sort of a funny organization in that we're like um, the way that we're like defining or like thinking mm -hmm. about this like AI governance problem mm -hmm. is like very very broad. Um, so like one way that I like sometimes describe what this like AI governance thing is is like oh it's like all the things that are required to like make AI go well that aren't technical AI safety, um, and that's like a lot of stuff. Uh, so that's like uh, several things at least, <laughs> at least more than one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like it like it will span like you know fields from like economics to like IR to like law to policy to like a yeah a tremendous amount of different topics, um, and so uh, and I think that will like probably continue to be the case going forward but i'm hoping that like over time we'll like uh start building up more and more like narrow expertise uh so like as we like hopefully get clearer on this like meta picture that like you're among other you among others are like working on uh we can like get clearer on like oh here are like some specific fields that we need people to work mm -hmm. on and we can like start to, like properly like figuring out uh, a lot of questions so like i think a few years down the line i would like really really want us and like others in this space to have like just like really solid at least like somewhat solid uh, answers mm -hmm. to questions like I don't know like um, a company comes to us and they ask like what kinds of publication norms should we have mm -hmm. uh, or like how should we uh, like um, like what sort of internal mechanisms should we have to make sure that we like are held accountable to the, these like lovely beautiful mm -hmm. principles that we've written about, mm -hmm. up, about how we'll like benefit humanity with our research or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we, we have that so far, um, but yeah, that, those are like examples of the kinds of questions that I'm like hoping and thinking uh, that we'll like uh, make some good progress on in the next few years. Yeah, um, I guess potentially last question. Um, besides just you know apply for the the GovEI fellowship, um, do you have any other like recommendations for just career wise, like what people who might be interested in this space should do if they want to potentially enter it or get a sense of if they want to enter it? Yeah, yeah, I think like. In general, I'm, I'm like, I quite like this this sort of recommendation of like if you if you're trying to figure out whether you should be doing X, then like try doing a bit of X. Um, so I think that's a pretty good suggestion. So uh, find some bit of research that you can do and try to do it. Uh, I think for most people, like so currently in this space, uh, yeah, there aren't a lot of opportunities that look like this GovEI fellowship, at least like in the like what you might call like the long termist AI governance space. Um, but like other things that look similar to that might be like. Mm -hmm. Um, the Center for uh, Security and Owned Emerging Technology, um, uh, so CSET, uh, based in Washington. Um, there's like sometimes there are like some like juniorish roles in places like DeepMind and OpenAI where you could do like this kind of research and this kind of work. Um, but I think like that are that's not like a lot of roles. Mm -hmm. That's like probably like I don't know like tops a dozen a year, uh, probably less. Um, and so I would encourage people to like think much more broadly. Uh, and so things that you could do are like looking at like one thing I'm very excited about people doing is like looking at trying to work in sort of policy teams, etc. in like a wider set of technology companies. Uh, so working at like places like Microsoft, uh, like Facebook, these kinds of places as they start building up like policy teams or like ethics teams. Uh, I think it'd be awesome to like have a lot of people like join these kinds of roles. Um, I guess another thing that a lot of people are doing that I think seems like reasonably like like a good idea for a lot of people is like just like using your studies to like dip your toe in the water. Um, and so some people will do this during like a bachelor's or a master's. They'll do like a dissertation on like AI governance related topics uh, and others will like um, I think quite a lot of people currently are like looking into doing sort of like PhDs uh, in this area as well, uh, which I think PhDs like one reason that a PhD might be a good option is just that like um, if you're a field and you're like trying to grow, um, it's going to be like very difficult to it's very difficult to like open up new roles. So in some cases, it can be like much easier as a field to grow by like um, 
I guess, yeah, a poor way of putting it is like co-opting other roles or something. And so like, you know, there are all these PhD like positions out there in the world. And so we could probably like have some people join those and like, you know, swivel them around such that they are on like topics that we think seem like long-termist, like really, really important uh, in this area. Um, I guess like the other like main tip is just like engage a lot with the research. Um, and so like, yeah, read all the all the things uh, like coming out of institutions such as us, uh, but also like places like the uh, like CSET, etc. Um, and in doing so, like try to like really really engage with the research. Um, and like when you read it, like yeah, like keep in mind that like these people uh, who are writing these things, they're like they're like smart and they're like good at what they do, but they're like by no means uh, sort of any oracles or like don't actually like have that much knowledge. Uh, actually, there's like a lot of uncertainty in this space. And so you should like, um, yeah, go into like reading these things with an attitude of like, um, you know, um, sort of keeping an open mind to a lot of these things being wrong and like being very, very like uh, critical and like trying to like actually form your own views. Uh, or at least like, yeah, I think like another like similar thing to that is like, don't just like read things and sort of take people's conclusions instead of try to like build them up yourself from the ground up or something. Uh, so like try to build up your like internal models of like how you think the world will go. Sounds good. Very wise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any any tips or like what would you um, have told your like past self? Um, I I'm, I don't think anything really beyond what you said. I guess what I would have told my past self is just uh, check your email in case Alan Defoe sends out an email looking for <laughs> research assistance in this area. Right. With like. And with like a fairly non-competitive process at that time, because not that right. many people were interested in it yet. Okay, so like so get real lucky. Get real that's, lucky that's, is I think yeah. exactly what it was with my past self. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's been it's been fun chatting. It's um, been great. Yeah, and and enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Yeah, and uh, my my new sign off is uh, stay safe, stay sane. See you later. <laughs>